Hey, everybody, we are back um, with Spencer George. Hello and welcome to the interview portion um, of tonight's episode. We were just uh, horsing around. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Cut that. Pretend that didn't happen. <laughs> we You're just... the one editing. <laughs> I'm, tell- I'm talking to my future self all the time. <laughs> um, no, we were just playing Red Dead Redemption Really good transition and... to a conversation about futurity, honestly. I, th- there we go. Honestly, uh, look, see, I planned it. It'll be great. Oh, great. Death Loris is here and we'll remember. Wonderful. Our mod <laughs> will be clipping this. <laughs> Amazing. But Spencer, welcome to the interview portion of the show. Before we start asking questions that we've curated for you, I think Dom gets to do the honors this week. Am I missing uh, anything? <laughs> no, I think I think I get to do the honors. Yeah. Uh, Spencer. Thanks for having me, y'all. It's really yeah. fun to be here. Thanks for oh, being absolutely. here. Oh my, thanks for choosing to spend a couple hours on a Tuesday night randomly with us. Like very. Cool. Oh, it's like fourteen <laughs> degrees here. So. This oh yeah. Is great. <laughs> what yeah, else are we too. doing? The south yeah. is frozen. <laughs> very fair. Very fair. The south is frozen. We don't know how to cope with this. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> anyway, Dom, over to you. Yeah. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, uh, Spencer, chat, I. Uh, you know, I'll do a throwback. Webster's Dictionary defines uh, sleuth as uh, either a, a noun, meaning a detective, or a transitive or intransitive verb, which I think is very funny as someone who majored in in Latin in undergrad that, that our English uh, verbs can be both trans. Hey, we have a whole team of, of guests. Not of guests. We have a whole team of folklorists <laughs> who help us write these questions. Even though you see Dom and Daisy, there's way more than Dom and Daisy writing your interview questions. So Spencer and anyone in chat, if you want to uh, appreciate a question, uh, don't just thank us. Thank the intrepid, beautiful, and uh, rigorous folkwise interview sleuths. I love some sleuthing. We love I, the sleuths. I fully back that. Yeah, we love. That's that's what it felt like to be me, while <laughs> while you were on leave last semester, because that is a Shirley style intro. That really was. Yeah, last semester I was doing my quals. Um, we had uh, one of our other friends and folkwise team members, Shirley, come on and like basically pretend to be me the entire semester um and just went on very long-winded sleuthing intros but um anyway yeah and dom you're, you haven't done it in now. a while I'm it's good it now. yeah <laughs> we miss it now but um with that thank you out of the way and chat um notice we have a sleuth emote if you all haven't been using it you can even i think use your wisdom points in the chat to specifically get one or maybe it's just a random one but hopefully it's the sleuthing one and that's really fun. i think it's a random one but you it's can you can gamble you can gamble on the sleuthing one in case you really want to cheer them on. But um, all that being said, are you ready to receive your first question? Go for it. Okay. Um, Spencer, how does your project, Good Folk, help address misconceptions about rurality? Yeah. Leading question. Um, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Let's see. How can I say this succinctly? So Good Folk was actually really born out of exactly that kind of idea. So it, it really started... So I grew up um, in an Appalachian, North Carolina family, both in North Carolina and then on the coast of South Carolina. And then when I turned, literally right after I turned 18, I moved to New York City for college, which is where I thought I want to be in the arts. That's where everybody goes to be in the arts. Didn't really feel like I fit in the South before it. So I was like, I'm going to have a community if I go to New York. And um, I'm sure everybody can see where this is going, which is that it did not go (laughs) well. Um, (laughs) I moved to New York in the fall of 2016. So that really that really changed things super quickly, um, both culturally and, and in my own life. And I was one of three students from South Carolina at my whole school. And I remember very quickly realizing in a way that I had never truly realized before how people saw the South outside of the region um, and specifically how people saw the rural South. And that became compounded for me over the course of my undergraduate education. I remember how Elegy was quite big at the time. So I was a creative writing student, started mm-hmm. writing about my Appalachian family, mostly as a way to kind of process this pressure that it felt like was being placed upon me that if I was like, a quote unquote kind of good liberal American that I would mm-hmm. never speak to my family again. And um, that never really sat right with me. And it felt really hard to think, oh, I, I might ideologically disagree with my family. And I also know that they're good people, right? Um, and at least at the very least, they've been good to me. So I started thinking about this tension and complication of what is it to love a place and want to call it home and also not know if you have space to call it home there. Um, 
And I remember writing about the South, getting it compared to Hillbilly Elegy and being, you know, being told that that was a compliment. Um, someone I worked Ooh, with in an office in New York tried to correct me on the pronunci pronunciation of Appalachia. She was like, it's Appalachia. And I was like, I'm Whoa, from there. Whoa, yikes. <laughs> yeah, Wild. she was like, you're saying it wrong. So there were a lot of compounding things that really made me understand very quickly in a way I was not prepared for the cultural misconceptions about this region. Um, and more and more, I was a human rights and English double major. So I was seeing how that kind of played out both in media and then how what we saw play out in media was creating a real story about the region that then was being reflected in people who are from there. That it's a running joke that like nobody hates the South more than Southerners um, in so many ways, especially Southerners who were told this is your home, but it's not your home because we don't want you here. So Good Folk was created as an idea in 2019. And I was thinking about this line that I kept repeating to myself when I would go home, which is, I, I do believe that people are good. And it was like, I don't even know that I fully believed it so much as I had to tell myself that in order to like think about the South in a way that I was like, I don't hate it here because I, I really do believe that there are good people here um, and specifically that there are good folk. So. Good folk was a kind of reclamation of the term, which had been used pretty derogatorily against rural Southern communities to say, not only are there good people here, there are also good folk here. And yeah, it was not created formally. I think I bought the website URL in 2019, but it was not formally created until the spring of 2021 when I was working as a teacher in rural middle schools and seeing very close uh, or very up close how the pandemic was playing out in rural spaces, how arts communities were playing out in rural spaces and yeah, that's that's about as succinct as I can get it. But that's kind of it means everything to think about an alternate version of rurality for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So like in maybe help for people who don't know what good folk is, maybe like how does the project like what are some mediums that you produce that speak to this like kind of vision of rurality or reclamation of good people in rural spaces, that kind of thing? So Good Folk is like first and foremost just a community project um, that has spiraled into a Substack newsletter and a podcast, which we also run through Substack and then stream out on Apple, Spotify, anywhere you can stream podcasts. We were originally just creating a newsletter to basically provide like an on the ground glimpse into rural spaces that it was like so rarely do rural storytellers get a platform. And so it was like, wow, Substack's a super cool medium that we can just put this directly in people's inboxes. Um, I was part of a teaching cohort that was mostly students in Phil or mostly teachers in Philadelphia and they were all remote and we were all not remote. And so it was like, even just that, it's like, what is it to be a teacher in the space? And then from there, everybody kept asking for a podcast and I very reluctantly became a podcaster. I had no desire to do it, did not want to, but we had a lot of cool artist friends in the South. So we're like, okay, we're just going to start interviewing our artist friends. And then that's that's where it started. We literally interviewed our whole friend group. And then I just started DMing people on Instagram and being like, hey, I think what you do is really cool. And it became the easiest way to make friends ever because you could just say, hey, I run this podcast and I think you're really awesome and I would love to interview you. And then what has been amazing is that out of that, I, I call it a community project because it really has grown this kind of new community of like young Southern artists. And we hosted a music festival this last summer with a bunch of the bands we had on the podcast. We've had like, we just had a holiday party with a bunch of good folk podcast guests. Like we hang out in real life. People are like collabing on each other's albums and tracks and songs. And it's really, really cool to see that grow and extend out of this like digital folklore community into a real life space. And eventually, I mean, we host, we are hoping to host workshops and collaborative spaces and more events, but yeah, newsletter, podcast. And if you live in North Carolina, feel free to come hang out. Hell yeah, you're just making me think about, like, um, the power of the folklorist as a networker. You know, bringing people together yes. who don't know how to get together. They don't know who they are or how to get together or, like, they're not brave enough to, like, DM somebody. It, like, or whatever. artistry all yeah. the time, where I think this has been a huge reckoning. So Good Folk is primarily a podcast about artists, but we leave that definition really open. We've had, like, queer florists and banjo players and, mm -hmm. like, digital designers, but... Yeah. I, I have really reframed my idea of what it is to be an artist where like, I think to be an organizer is also an artist. And that feels like the role that I'm playing right now where I'm like, I'm a creative writer. I don't feel like I'm writing nearly as much as I used to, but I'm connecting artists to I'm like, okay, you do this thing and you do this thing and you two should connect and meet. And um, that is like, to me, a really, really cool form of artistry. And I think that's also the job of a folklorist is to be this kind of like, organizing peace and to see those connections and try to bring people together around it. I think it can be really powerful when we do that. Yeah, that's awesome. Hell yeah. 
I always like to tell people I am the extension cord. Yes, yeah. I love that. Yeah, you are totally an extension cord. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Also, if I may, I hope that person who tried to New York City explain the, the pronunciation of Appalachia, you like threw an apple at them so uh -huh. they wouldn't. Yeah. You know what's really sad is like it took me so long to even embrace my identity as a southerner that I think I was like 18. It was my first internship. That's and I so think hard I was just to like, stand oh, up you're like right. A, yeah. Like. I can't believe I didn't like, oh, it must be because they're like a publishing executive and I don't I don't see myself as a yeah. valuation because again, to what we talk about in folklore, it's like this valuation of kind of vernacular and local mm -hmm. expertise where mm -hmm. what at 18, what I saw as being an expert was not local knowledge, right? It was like, oh, I have yeah. all of these degrees behind my name. Yeah. So I think I literally let them just tell me that it was wrong. and. And then I started second guessing myself. So that's also why we need folklorists yeah. to create this yeah. other valuation of local expertise, for sure. Totally. And like, I mean, there's so many intersectional identities and powers at play in those kinds of contexts, too. Like, I don't know, maybe the person would, if you had backed up, you know, you never know what people would say. Just be like, uh, you're going to yeah. say, you're going to tell me, distinguished professor, that I don't know how to say apple posh, ha. Huh? I relive that <laughs> conversation all the time where I'm like, my God, I wish I could go back as my like 25-year-old yeah. self mm -hmm. and and sit them down and, and have a real like, conversation yeah. about it. But, you know, that's on growth, so... <laughs> <laughs> that's at least, true. At least you said sit them gra uh, sit them down and have a real conversation. Because I was yeah, picturing like that panel way, yeah. of Yeah, I was picturing when Batman has to slap Robin in that one issue <laughs> yeah. in the sixties. Don't worry, there was some anger. There was a good like five years of anger There's about anger all of this. It. And now I feel like I've I've mellowed out a little bit yeah. where I was like, All right, yeah. this is really wrong culturally. And now it's Hell like, yeah. well, me being angry doesn't do a lot of good. Um there's a mm. great Maya Angelou quote about that, about yeah. like, using your anger. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm using my anger. And I'm, I'm channeling into education, but it is a challenge. Yeah, I totally understand that. Um, as a person who had a cat destroy my my copy of Why Does the Cage Bird Sing? Um, that was so sad. But yes, I know. I think about my Angelou a lot. I'm like, why is my cat eating this book? Anyway. I wonder, um, I wonder where that was going. Anyway, <laughs> my cat ate this book. And you got there at the end. I yeah. like it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway. Oh, are you ready for your next question? Go. Yes. Okay. I'll try to stop going in tangents. But no. 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 This is a pro the tangent idea podcast. Is tangents. Yeah, this is a pro tangent podcast. Yeah. Um, so are we. I, so are we. Like, as Daisy knows. <laughs> to be fair, when you were like, uh, oh, kind of a leading question, I, I was sitting there like, we'll get a tangent out of that. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, all right. Could have so, gone on for an hour. You're lucky it was only like 10 minutes. Well, I don't know. We'll have to see where you go with this next one because it could also right, be that. Right. Go, <laughs> Spencer, me. what is environmental futurism and what's an example of it within your research or your work that you do? Yes. Great question. <laughs> I got to think about how to do this succinctly. So the way that I think about environmental futurism is kind of a challenge to this really apocalyptic, disastrous mode of climate change, right? Um, particularly in the South, when we tend to see climate changes mattering, and not just the South, but it, it really matters to the South right now, because the South unequivocally is the region set to face the greatest effects of climate change, is facing the greatest effects of climate change, is not often talked about in the mainstream climate conversation, unless it's New Orleans, unless it's the wake of disaster, the wake of a hurricane, the wake of a flood, right? We don't want to think about resilience. We don't want to think about preparation. So to me, environmental futurism is thinking about the environment in this kind of alternate imaginary. So not just saying, wow, the data is bad. What we're looking at in our lived everyday experience is bad. We can't do anything. We just have to hope this goes away. But thinking instead, if we were to paint kind of an alternate picture or an alternate future, what would it look like? Um, and I think one thing that is a bit of a challenge with environmental futurism is that you have to get a little bit away from this anthropocentric view of nature and climate change, right? So we think of climate change largely as affecting humans, or that's how it's often culturally played out. Like every disaster film is about like the flood that washes away humans, um, the earthquake, you know, there's a million and one disaster films that you could think about. But specifically what I have mentioned earlier of like the Loblaw and longleaf pine trees. So these are trees that are facing climate change pretty heavily right now where salt water is getting into the root systems and the trees cannot grow anymore. The other thing that comes up a lot in my research, and I should say I work um, primarily on the coast of South Carolina. So I'm from Charleston. That's, or that's where I've called home. I moved back to North Carolina in 2020, but until that, uh, Charleston is where I called home for about 10 years. 
It's where my family and my mom still is. And Charleston is part of the low country region of South Carolina, which is where I focus my research. I look mainly at Beaufort County, which is just south of Charleston. In 2020, 2021, Beaufort County got ranked um, the number one county of anywhere in America by ProPublica, set to experience the worst effects of climate change. I had never heard anybody talk about that data. Nobody in Beaufort County was talking about that data. So thinking about for a place like Beaufort, which is staring down a pretty impending crisis, you know, it's, it's going to happen. The data is kind of like, we're not getting out of this. How do we think about futurism in a way that is not just like apocalypse disaster, we're all going to have to leave? Because the other reality with climate change is that people are not always going to be able to leave. You know, that's a really privileged position to take. So when I think about futurism, it's thinking about how do we reframe our relationship to environment, our relationship to disaster, looking at something like a ghost forest, which is these trees I was mentioning that don't grow, not as this like horrible, you know, beacon of the end times, but as a potential kind of shift to th could this be beautiful even in decay um the best example that i've been writing about a lot lately which i i'm a writer so i work a lot in narrative is jeff vandermeer's annihilation and, and hear me out on this <laughs> so oh, annihilation yeah, Pride of tallahassee exactly so a lot of people know annihilation as like a science fiction novel so i work a lot with like science fiction and climate fiction annihilation however i will make a case as a read for like an environmental southern gothic novel because it is science fiction but it's also based on a real life florida swamp and it creates this landscape where humans cannot survive in their like human anthropocentric form, but by adapting into the landscape, they get to like live on in all these alternate spaces. So the book and the movie are really different, but they both paint this super similarly. And it's thinking about a challenge to this idea of annihilation into regeneration. And Southern Gothicism, I think, does this as well, where nothing is ever really dead or alive, right? Like what dies continues to live and can have these alternate futures. So there's a lot there to it. Um, I work largely on the island of St. Helena right now in Beaufort. I work with a lot of really incredible Afrofuturists who are just thinking a ton about futurism um, and about environmental relationships and have really pushed and challenged a lot of my thinking there. So I feel really lucky for the people I get to work with and for the people who have forced me to think not in terms of, oh, this is bad. There's no point in working here or staying here. But what is it to make a choice to choose and fight, even if we don't know if we face down crisis or regeneration. And to believe, I think, as well, in the possibility of regeneration as much as decay, um, even if it's not for us. It's, you know, can we save the trees, but maybe not ourselves. So that's um, another long-winded answer to that. No, that was so good. Chat is popping off right now. <laughs> First, I don't know if you've read um, or know about uh, this book that's edited by Shelley Ingram and Willow Mullins called Wait Five Minutes. It's all about weather lore in the 21st century. I have read one of, like, I've read an yeah. excerpt from it, okay. but not the full thing. Because I was yeah. like, because they're both folklorists. So I was like, I'm just, you know, and then Death Loris dropped the link in the chat. So, like, if you haven't seen that, like, you gotta check it out. Um, yeah, I gotta then, read the full thing for sure. Yeah, and chat's like a dropping Annihilation, the novel, links to the novel and stuff like that, too. But yeah, also, I've got a paper that I've been writing about Annihilation. Yeah. I'm trying to get it published somewhere. Uh, so if anybody wants to talk to me about it, if anybody it, wants it, me. <laughs> if anybody wants my it. Southern Gothic read of Annihilation yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. about regeneration, yeah, the most let me know. fascinating thing a guest has said in some time. <laughs> yeah, honestly true. Honestly true. Um, I it was for um it was for Jordan Lovejoy's class that I oh, wrote yeah. the first draft mm. of this and Hell I pitched yeah. it to Jordan. I was like, I want to write about annihilation as like a Southern Gothic climate change novel, and she was like, Okay. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> I right, right, do it. Right She's like, Yeah. Just just go for it. Um, go and for, we yeah. did. And, you know, I just used it to apply to a bunch of PhD programs. So we'll Hell see yeah. if it works. <laughs> Honestly, you gotta, yeah, you gotta go what's in your, what's in your gut, whatever's speaking to you is the thing yeah. that you gotta But it's such a, I mean, if, if you yeah. haven't read or seen the book, it really is like an incredible, so I talk a lot about Southern Gothic because I do think it's super related to environment in that Southern Gothic is a genre we think of as like super historical and not at all modern, right? Mm -hmm. Mostly because Southern Gothic was created as a challenge or a way to like reckon with what people saw or what writers saw as like the social problems of the time. So. Mm -hmm you know, religion, racism, gendered violence, yeah. like those were all things you saw a lot in this early version of Southern Gothic. And then as people like culturally assume those problems died out, we see this idea of like the genre not being relevant anymore because people are like, well, we don't have to respond to racism anymore because it doesn't exist anymore. And that's like totally false, of course. Um, so now you have this new movement of like, what I, the Chicago Public Library technically defined this and I stole it, but it's called Neo Southern Gothic. And um, the best example I can give of this is like Beyonce's Lemonade. And I gave a lecture in Dr. Mm. Patricia Sawin's class about this yeah. last year of the use of Southern Gothic or the Neo Southern Gothic in um, 
Beyonce's Lemonade, Adia Victoria, who is a singer-songwriter from upstate South Carolina who's now working in Nashville, does this. And, like, she's got a great album called A Southern Gothic. Highly recommend. It's, like, a modern folk spin. So good. Um, a friend of mine who we had on the podcast named the official bard of Baldwin County, who is in Alabama, who's actually on tour on the West Coast right now with Odie Lay, has a song Whoa. called Cicada Waltz that is, like, <gasps> another Cic- incredible example. Cic- You've got, Daisy, you will love okay. this. <laughs> I, I yeah, would Cicada Waltz. I'm like, love these this. are all the people doing, like, neo-Southern Gothic. Um, Virginia Haslock, who I mentioned earlier. There's, like, just so many people who are using this mode to reckon, wow. again, with, like, the problems that we're seeing. And what I find really interesting about it is that most people who are using this neo-Southern Gothic mode today are doing it in a lot of ways to respond to environmental change um, and to reckon with that. So Annihilation is one example, but there are so many, and that is what I'm trying to get a doctorate in. So Hell stay yeah. tuned. Death Florist was like, you have to do this <laughs> in the chat. So <laughs> so you have a lot of support here for pursuing that project. It sounds really fascinating. Yes. Um, it's it's very cool, um, and I think it. I think Southern Gothic is the best way we can read into it to to just tie the futurism thing back up because it's like it might not always be beautiful, right? It might not always be hopeful. So where can you find these kind of a removal of a binary and of this idea that the South is either like glorified and historic and beautiful or, you know, depraved and ruinous and like the swamp and the bayou versus like the downtown sprawling city. It's the South is both um, and Southern environments are both. So that's the only genre I know of that allows it to be both. And I think that's, that's really cool. important when we when we craft our approach to the future and our environmental you know, relationships within it. You have basically set up perfectly our next question, so I'm just gonna ask it. I'm reading um, your mind. Okay, yeah, it's like it's like a little it, it's a little bit different, but uh, yeah, it speaks right to this. It's a it's like a sort of a creative writing methods question. So, okay. as a creative writer, what are some of the methods that you use to bring together both fiction and folklore? Because there are two areas that have oh not God, always been question. super complimentary, <laughs> but you're doing it. <laughs> And let, yes. let us know. Yeah. Oh, my God. I love this question. Because when I went back to apply to graduate school to be a folklorist, I met with a bunch of people in the UNC program. And I said, so here's the thing. I'm between going to this program or going into an MFA. But I don't really want to do an MFA because I think right now we have too many writers working like purely in the speculative who are creating all these stereotypes because they're living entirely in an imagination about a specifically like a regional imagination and not actually going out and like working within a place and paying attention to it. And so if I'm going to continue as a writer, I want the space to like really go and work in the communities that I'm working with and writing about. So I came back to school as a folklorist and have just spent the last few years like relearning how to pay attention. And everything I write now has come out of that exactly. So the project that I am currently at work on, which I describe as very loosely a neo-Southern Gothic novel set um, half in a post kind of climate change Appalachia, half on a low country coast dealing with a pine tree god and uh, the individuals who worship him. I have basically taken completely out of my field work um, and have found myself learning how to pay attention to spaces and find endless inspiration in them. Really specifically rural spaces, which feel very at home to me. um, And, you know, have, I'm not currently living in a rural space. I'm currently living in Chapel Hill, but we are surrounded 45 minutes in any direction by some pretty rural spaces. And before that, I was living in some pretty rural spaces. And one of the stories I had published recently, I wrote about um, a queer couple who gets trapped in their apartment after a flood washes out the coast and it floods the basement and they're trapped upstairs. And I was thinking about FEMA. I was thinking about disaster. I was thinking about my own life and the characters that I have in my life um, based it on a town that I used to drive through every day. And that piece was actually published um, in the 2023 Saints and Sinners Anthology through the Tennessee Williams Literary Festival. So there is a lot of space emerging for writers who are thinking about representations of the world around them, which I think is exactly what it is to be a folklorist. Um, To me, folklore is like evidence that we're here and that we exist and that we're attempting to make meaning. And that's the same thing it means to me, I think, to be a writer. So I don't feel like I could have continued on as a writer in any way, if not for folklore. And I don't, I think they have to be connected. Because if you're writing purely in the speculative, it's not that it's all bad. Like, there's some incredible mm-hmm. fantasy novels out there. But if you are going to write about a real place, I think you need to be working in that space. And that goes for film as well. I should say, like, one of the one of the markets I think we need folklorists in are, like, community liaisons for film sets. 
The Hunger Games is like one of the best examples I can give of this, where they came to North Carolina, they filmed in North Carolina, they based District 12 on Appalachia. And it is like so very <laughs> clear that nobody really <laughs> knew what Appalachia was in mm-hmm. that film. And I knew people who like came up for the weekend and were film extras on the set and you know nobody was paid yeah. the communities that were filmed were not consulted and i'm like that's where folklorists can do a lot of really great work and kind of blending this gap between like storytelling fiction imaginary spaces real life real communities yeah. and the stories that get crafted about them is being yeah. you know um dom to your point earlier kind of that what, what was the word you used it was great uh extension Organizer. cord oh extension yeah extension cord, cord. Yeah. Extension yeah. cord <laughs> between the hollywood directors who want to make a film mm-hmm. about a location that is not Hollywood and the people yeah. who the film is actually about. We can the be the people with the, people with the juice, as it were. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're making me think so much, too, about how a lot of people say that they, like, go... A, a lot of, I would say, writers or creative writers, they go and spend time or do research in place, but they don't talk to anybody. They just, like, drive around <laughs> yeah. or whatever. It's very different to write, and obviously there's lots of different... There's so many different types of writing, but to write specifically about the future of a place without like a kind of deep sense or integration into the community or, or whatever, like it's part of you. It makes sense that writing in this sense or the writing in the way that you're doing it is almost like you're telling a story about a place, but you're also telling the story for yourself more than anyone else about how to understand yourself in context and in the context of whatever our future will become. I don't know. It's you're making me yeah. think on like a couple different levels about like the creative writing and folklore and personal narrative, but not because One of the it's speculative and like how yeah. I read in a folklore class mm-hmm. was um Selena Morales and Mel- Maribel Alvarez's the Ten Lessons in Community Love piece. And yes. I remember I wrote That's it really in good. big letters on the very first thing. I think it's like number seven or it might be number one, yeah. but it says what we do affects real people. And I was like, that is why I came to be a folklorist. Because writers and artists, you know, there's sometimes a bit of a gap with that of like, oh, I'm writing about this thing, but it's, you know, just it's an imaginary story. And we forget that like what we do affects real people and affects real culture and it affects how people see culture. Um, and I think that's a power that we should, I think we take a little too lightly sometimes. Yeah, I think that it, you're you're doing that important, you know, work of bridging these areas that are not always like fiction and folklore haven't always had the best relationship despite being housed in like English programs a lot and coming from some written down language traditions in some ways but like this is a totally like different take on that entirely and you're blending something that's like a challenging to blend I don't know Dom I heard you pipe you were gonna say something no yeah because it's interesting that you mentioned fantasy Mm-hmm. As your example of that, because like if, if in order for fantasy to be good, you you need like like the the vox populi, like the the fellowship doesn't work without the hobbits because like they ground it and they let you know how like regular people run around it, it, like with their shoes off in that world. You know what I mean? It's like that's why like I don't know. Here's the secret to Game of Thrones. It's why 60% takes place in the Riverlands because it's regular people talking. You know what I mean? But there is like fantasy authors have figured that out. I just like have I, I, but they yeah, don't do I it. want folklorists. I want folklorists to be aware that we are the voice of regular people talking of history. The, mm-hmm. the, the crucial thing that grounds narrative. Yeah. Yeah. And like there's something about in those like with those rise or at least dominator huge song rise fire fans is why we're both thinking about this yeah, but we might be. <laughs> we might, we might be. but uh um, you 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 may have seen uh daisy as uh joffrey in a, in a certain youtube video that uh like three hundred thousand people have seen. yeah but, I don't okay know. i accidentally um, cosplayed data race at my high school graduation i had like long i oh, you can... my hair and it was long. i'll send you're you like not photo. trying oh, yeah. to do it but you kind of no, i literally oh, i cute. wasn't even trying but it was like perfect what, yeah. what year did you graduate perfect. high school yeah 2016. Yeah, she was the moment. Yeah, that was yeah. the moment. Yeah. yeah, it was culturally like there was no way I could have shown yeah. up looking like I did and, and yeah. people wouldn't have made that connection. Yeah, exactly. And I just ran with it. I was like, absolutely. Yeah. Any day. Um, But they, they're good at like, okay, so some fantasy writers like George Martin or whatever, we can choose a couple examples. They understand how like the transmission of folklore works and why yeah. that's valuable. But that's still different. Like you're making up a group of people to develop that lore versus like exactly. taking the actual <laughs> real lives of people here today set in, you know, 2024, like USA, wherever region. Like that's a very different um yeah, and to your point about to, like the, to people, yeah. What is the relationship between folklore and writing? I'm like, I don't even know. For me as a writer right now, because I used to want to be like a total fantasy writer, and I was like doing all this crazy stuff. But I'm like, what I 
think of now is I'm like, I drive through rural Ohio and I'm like, this is all the inspiration I need. Like, look around. Like, there is nothing I need more than like this oh. weird barn in the middle of nowhere or this like perfect suburban mansion just in the middle of nowhere, know, right? Yeah. Um, last, I was driving through Ohio a couple months ago on the way to Michigan and there was just like a horse and buggy just driving through a field. And I'm like, American Gothic is, I want like an American Gothic fantasy series. And I mean, I think Neil Gaiman probably gets the closest to anyone I know with this. Uh, um, and has some decent quotes about like the idea of the real America. But I'm like, there's a lot about the real America that has been co-opted by yeah. folklore. And that I think we need to be challenging. And that is where it's like, what does it mean to actually pay attention to a place and yeah. try to reflect that? And then to even put a spin on it and create like a fictionalized imaginary version no, we've got plenty of lore in Appalachia, but I also think it's important to give the voice to people who are from that community first. You know, I'm like, I don't want a fantasy writer from Brooklyn coming down, spending three months in Appalachia being like, wow, look at all the lore that happens here. Let me go write a best selling series about it. So there's like, <laughs> thanks, there's Janie so many Vance. Problems. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Yeah, he's, he's, he's <laughs> His fantasy. With his I will fantasy. claim him from Appalachia. You're from Ohio, dumbass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. dude. You're, from, not... you're, from, you're not even from Appalachian, Ohio. <laughs> and he's become like the Appalachian voice. I'm I thinking know. one of the things that irks me the most, and, and anyone who's listened to Good Folk Podcast has like heard me rant about this, but this like TikTok trend of all the people who are like, don't go out in the Appalachian woods alone at night. And it's like, oh, very yeah. rarely people who are from Appalachia who are saying this stuff, but exactly. it's like trendy. And it's going to get you views to go on and like talk about how scary Appalachia is. And I'm like, it's not to say that like weird things don't happen in the woods here, but when that's the common narrative that gets painted and it's not being painted by people who are by and large from here, like, what does that say about the region? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, that adds, there's a lot there. It sort of like indirectly adds to that narrative of it being either a place where bad things happen or where nothing is and therefore you can make excuses to extract from it because it doesn't matter yes. and no one's there and only bad things that kind of thing so yeah it makes my thesis work right now is actually looking primarily mm -hmm. at um like tourism sites and beach spaces and so in beaufort county that's where hilton head is and so this mm -hmm. idea I'm, I'm doing a lot with like bucktine and carnival but people who come for this like time out of time folklore experience right so i'm going on a beach vacation for a week I'm partying it up. I'm not living my real life. And therefore I'm detached from the idea that real people actually live in a place um, and that this yeah. is someone's real home. And so I don't feel the need to care for it in any meaningful way. And I can make it, um, mm -hmm. you know, the language that's often used is like a nat national sacrifice zone that Appalachia is a great example of that, that real people don't live here. So it doesn't matter what we do to it. We can sacrifice it for the greater good. Even I was watching the caucus last night and they were talking about, you know, Iowa doesn't really matter because it's all rural. It'll be interesting to see what happens with real people in New Hampshire. And I'm Ooh, like, oh my God. What an interesting way to say <laughs> yeah, that. I paused, I paused <laughs> Telling on and yourself. I like, and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> but it's like, but that's, I mean, that's yeah. like all in mainstream news. That's on NBC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this permeates through the way we see the all of America. You know, we've got so many urban studies departments. There's not a single rural studies department that I know of. So, yeah. and if there is, let they're me know. All, they're all, been, yeah, yeah, they're all like uh, housed inside other conversations. Yeah, or, or like spaces, agriculture yeah. studies apart yeah. departments. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we're not really studying rural culture and we don't really have a clear idea of like mm -hmm. what that is. Nor do oh we have God. a good idea of what American culture is. So it creates all these complications that just permeate throughout everything. <laughs> Baby Mary Hufford over here being like, Bakhtin and the Carnivalesque, you read that King Cole paper. I just, yep, <laughs> I so literally good. just did. Yeah, it's such, I love such that a paper. good paper. That paper changed, so it changed my entire <laughs> thesis approach where yeah. I was like, oh my oh. God, I can apply this to beach yeah. tourism sites. Oh, for um, sure. And like yeah. beach towns and vacation towns. But for yes, sure. shout out to oh. Mary Hufford's King Cole paper because it is excellent. Mary Hufford, please someday stop training your dog, your little puppy to do truffle hunting and come on Folkwise and play Bee Simulator. <laughs> yeah, please. Hey, um, hell yeah. I know we're going long, but can I just like say <laughs> yeah. two two comments just to put a pin in this? Yeah. Uh, one, Neil, Neil Gaiman, take one like belief studies class and then rewrite American Gods. I Honestly, fucking dare you. I fucking dare and you. <laughs> And, I'd love uh, to rewrite it. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> right? I know. It's it's out there. Yeah, anyone any one of us could do it better. And number two, uh, uh Spencer, you ever read Fables? No. Oh, okay. you might be the, into Fables. Yeah. You might be into that. As American Gothic fairy tale shit. I, I would say read Fables just so you can get to Jack's like spin-off. 
but okay yeah there's like anyway. it's basically like um i don't know all fairy tale creatures live in the present moment and then also the fairy tale land uh, kind of crossed over with urban legend or contemporary legend land so like oh, they cool. all that's only that, that that that's more the element in the game i yeah. guess that's true that's the element in the yeah. game more than anything yeah. that's what well, we've I the, the, hope in the game is that they they, may, they meet an urban legend and don't know what to do yeah yeah please send me recommendations because i've been okay. trying to find <laughs> a fantasy so i have Hell been yeah. reading my way through multiple different fantasy series this year trying to find like one chad is saying like. chad is saying in all caps you should read fables, you should read fables. all right i'm gonna read fables <laughs> okay, thank, okay, you. okay. thank you for the recommendation all right we got a final a little more like serious question before we get to some funsy questions okay so i can't if well, i'm just gonna say it. okay <laughs> how does knowing how to code switch as a folklorist help you in your field work on climate change Elaborate on what you mean by code switching. Okay, my so this is coming to us from thinking about. This is one of those moments in this in the sleuthing meeting where we were like, we want to talk about this abstract thing. We figured out how to say it, but we know. Noticed... No, I can. I, 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 you got it. I, I, I think you can. I think you can elaborate without yeah, giving I the think question. I, yeah, I, think I, I I'm know going what to. you mean. I think yeah. so. So we were t noticing that a lot of your published writing or your very like widely publicly available writing talks about water. Both, you know, you're citing people who talk about water, you're talking about water, you're talking about flooding, you're talking about salt water. Um, but you talk about water and flooding and salt water and trees, but you don't talk, you don't say climate change, right? Mm -hmm. Because knowing mm -hmm. your context knows that your, no, audience. Pe your audience, people aren't going to read it if you say climate disaster necessarily, depending on what you're doing and where you are. So we are noticing that you are doing a really good job at code switching how you talk about um climate change or ecological disaster or whatever in the context of your communities so maybe how did how does knowing how to code switch then help um your field work yeah i ask about the code switching only because i was wondering if you're sleuthing so one of the first meetings i had with one of my writing professors at college they said you're good at what you do because you know how to code switch north and south. What? Yeah. Oh my, okay, we, yeah. we picked up on it too. So that that's not independent then. <laughs> so you can I back that up. It's, that's it's so funny. It's been said to me before. Interesting. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know, I don't have a Southern accent. I had a very deep Southern oh, accent Oh, wait, kid. you say, really? You don't, you, well, I'm trying to get it back. So actually uh, it's a I hear, I, but. I hear some vowels. There are yeah. the vowels, oh, there's the some, vowels there's give some it away. vowels, you know. I've yeah, been back yeah, in the South for about four and a half years now, but. When I was a teenager, I remember I said to my mom, my mom was um, a first generation college student, first person to leave North Carolina, went to do New York straight out of college and did not have a great experience. And so I remember when I was a teenager, I said to my mom, I want to move to New York. That's like my dream. I'm going to go be a writer there. And she said, well, we're going to get rid of the accent and and kind of trained no. it out of me, which is um, no. a very common experience. Yeah, I was going to say, that's I, unfortunately not unique. Yeah. Unfortunately <laughs> yeah. not unique. Yeah. Um, but it was something that when I was in New York, people didn't often pick up on me being Southern. So I would have a lot of conversations with people and they were really willing to like tell me exactly what they thought before I would say, oh, actually, well, I'm from there. And then it would change super fast. So the code switching, I think, was something I learned just really inherently um, in a lot of those conversations. And to bring it back to the environmental piece, it was actually something that came up when I first got into climate change research. It was in, I took an eco-criticism class as an undergraduate, just totally for fun. And we had to do a final project and I decided to start writing about Charleston, which, you know, when I grew up in Charleston, like obviously flooding is a thing. I didn't think of it as climate change. Um, I thought of it as, oh, it's like a snow day here. You know, we get the day off school because the parking lot's flooded and we're kayaking through the streets. People go swimming. It's I like had the fun. same thing like, in, in Southern California, but it was like fire and smoke days yeah. <laughs> or like you yeah. couldn't go it to school because the, so yeah, normalized it like, that it, mm -hmm. it never once crossed my mind to think of this as like, oh, this is a really bad thing. And so when I started doing that research, I guess it was like 2018, 2019. Um, there was at the time, a lot of buzz starting to happen about Charleston with climate change. The Weather Channel had done like a simulated news report where they used a green screen to have a reporter talking like in a fictional Charleston and there's like water up to their waist as if like, oh, this is our new normal. So it was starting to be talked about a lot, but I ended up um, getting a contract to work with Bitter Southerner to write about how artists were responding to climate change because they were the only ones who were talking about it. And in the conversations that I was having in the initial research for that piece, everyone said, here, they did not use the word climate change publicly at a governmental level, like a local government level until 2016, because it was not popular as a political platform, basically, until then. And so it was a thing that everybody could understand sea level rise, you know, sea level rise, 
flooding tides like talking about that you can was you not can controversial see, you can see you the can flood see water flooding. rising yeah. you can't it's see like, climate change exactly. whatever you know it's very vague yeah so anybody who's living on the coast like nobody can deny that we see more flooding than we used to it's like yeah we see flooding but that's just high tide right or that's just that's just part of living in you know everyday conditions on the coast there's this shift that happens when you start to think about it as climate change that actually becomes divisive. And I don't really know when in my own work, I, I don't know if it's ever something I've thought about consciously. I just think I knew, you know, I, I come from a family where I don't largely agree with most of them. Um, so I learned how to do this very early on in my own life. And I talk a lot um, in my thesis work about Archie Green's concept of sitting with tension and kind of this call for cultural practitioners to learn how to do that. And I'm like, to me, this is a little bit of what it means to learn how to sit with tension. It's to know that if I start going into spaces and saying, what do you think about climate change? How are you seeing that? People might shut down and they won't talk to me. But if I go into a space and I say, can you describe to me how you see flooding? People will talk to me about that. Um, and that is a really interesting thing that I've picked up on and noticed. I don't know that I do it consciously, but you're right. It has been said to me, it has been said to me before. And I think it's something you have to learn working in Southern rural spaces. You kind of do have to know, you know, I know sometimes when to bring my accent out a little bit more, um, and I know when to turn it off. And I hate that that's the case, but but it is true. But that's just, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, that's part of it in some ways. But um, fascinating that that came up before, too. So like maybe maybe the <laughs> I wondered if you had sleuthed and like found, I know we, we talked literally... about it in a Good Folk podcast. So I was like, I wondered no. how deep your sleuthing went. Well, I mean, we've looked at some stuff, but not uh, not that <laughs> deep, I don't think. But yeah, the we fact... did. No, well... that's what it was. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um shout out to the sleuthing team because you really <laughs> you really dug deep hell yeah sleuths let's go no but really though like and, and maybe maybe it isn't something that can be like taught maybe it's kind of part of just your context as a writer and it's just a thing that you know how to do because um you're just hyper attuned to having to do that yourself so in regular space so it just makes sense in your writing to do it too that's cool. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. it's a skill folklorists learn. Like, yeah. when you're learning how to pay attention and notice how people think and what people feel, mm -hmm. you, you do, I mean, it's empathy studies, right? And we don't really teach critical empathy studies, but I think the more you learn how to pay attention to the world, the more empathetic you naturally become. And to me, to be empathetic is not to like, people think of empathy and sympathy the same, but I think being an empathetic person is just making an attempt to understand where people are coming from. And so I'm like, if you've never heard the language climate change, also climate change, like the idea just shuts people down. Of like yeah. climate change is this big, scary, yeah. frightening thing. And it's like, sometimes you have to dial it back to, well, how are we actually seeing it play out? And to get people to understand like, this is happening here. Cause you might not, you might think of climate change as like a future hurricane that's gonna wipe everything out. But you can understand that like, this beach has eroded five feet more than it did last year. And so that's like, well, not five feet. That's an exaggeration. But, but I, you know, yeah. this is the yeah, thing I where like, I talk, I, I talk to people and they're like, oh, I used to go to this beach and like walk my dog. And now I go and it's like a cliff. And I'm yeah. like, that's something that people can see and they can feel and they can wrap their head around. Whereas climate change, the way we paint it culturally is like a disaster film. And people can't wrap their head around that as like, oh, that's actually happening to me. You know, it's slow violence. It's yeah. 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 That's the best way I can describe it. So steal that one right from yeah. Rob Nixon. But I, I, I hear you, though. <laughs> uh, we got a couple funzy questions for you that I think can be a little more rapid fire. Dom has the first one, though. Yeah, I'll try to be rapid fire. Oh, no, you can give I do. Yes, I do. Yes, yeah, they go. <laughs> um, what was it like living in a Canadian anime? And by that, I mean you were apparently a boys summer camp counselor. So even better, I was a yoga instructor. Oh no! Boys summer camp. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! What the hell? <laughs> it was such an out-of-body experience. I turned 21 while working for. I was the only American, I should say, as well in this entire summer camp, and it That's was the most so fun I've ever had. I made some of my best friends for life. Um, the bo the campers were all boys. The program staff, which were like we're the people who run the activities, were like co-ed international staff and so mm -hmm. we were all there for like it's an easy visa to get to go live somewhere for like a couple yeah. of months um i just wanted to get out of the city and so i got tipsy on new year's and found out that i could go to canada and i was like i'm well, i'm gonna go do it. it but the story is that um so i have a male name obviously or a traditionally male name and i will say this because i know this is rapid fire i'll be succinct when i got the email i emailed them back because i was like oh they've made a mistake they've like i it's not the first time i've been mistaken for a man in a job interview so they must just think i'm a guy and they're like oh no Oh, it's fine um but it was crazy it was wild it was so much fun i was supposed to go back for multiple years and covid shut it down but i love canada i love that place and it 
I'll let you, you know, hold it in your imagination. I can, I can only imagine these stories that you tell at cocktail parties. Oh, yeah, they're great. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. next question. Get me uh, off the clock, we'll talk. <laughs> Do you have a theme or vision for Good Folk Fest 2024? Yeah, so Good Folk Fest 2024 has been discussed. We are not sure what it will look like yet, um, mostly because <laughs> on the theme of going to Canada, I'm going to Alaska for a month. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. yeah, so I, I graduate with my master's in May, and then I'm going off grid for a month. And um, I am hoping to go into some sort of PhD program, but I'm not sure where that will be yet. So Good Folk Fest is a little up in the air because I don't know where I will be living at that point in time. Sure, um, sure. But I would love for it to continue to be some sort of celebration of emerging southern artists you know we raised over two thousand dollars for local north carolina musicians and that felt that felt really amazing so just to get to showcase you know good folk is nothing without the community behind it so just to get to showcase who that community is and and put the spotlight back on them so yeah we'll see stay tuned hell yeah um what's the worst drink you ever had to make as a barista (laughs) oh my god oh well my coworker and i for halloween one time we decided that we were going to make some like really fun weird halloween specials we just were totally going off the rails amazing we made this like iced matcha tea and then we we used um i worked at a tea house i should say as a barista so we had teas and coffee and also mead which is the most like oh, folklore yeah. thing i totally. can think of <laughs> um yeah my my partner got me a mead making kit for christmas oh my God. so yeah very folklore gift um really fun it's like 20 bucks on amazon but we anyway we made this oh iced matcha with like this purple tea from this like hibiscus tea we made a cold foam and oh, we yeah. like put that on top and we called it like a goblin drink <laughs> and we thought it was so fun and so cool we're like oh my god it looks so halloween people are gonna love this and like nobody ordered it we also had to do like a s'mores latte once so oh, we yeah. had to like burn the s'more and i almost killed myself many times oh my god so those were two I... drinks that stand okay. out for sure well those are like cool drinks i just remember how Man, i had made to a make cold foam agua de jamaica yeah, I you know. know. Yeah. <laughs> That's a you made, weird you made, fast. You made a new kind it of Mexican taste, food. It did not taste good, but it looked <laughs> well, really good. Because that shit is mostly sugar. But. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! I, I think just... if we'd done like a green tea with the cold foam, it would have been better. It was like something of a. It, too, it was <sighs> just too many things to mix. Yeah, that's fair. It looked yeah, really yeah, yeah. fun. I have like ice cream tea nightmares from a person who would always order uh, an iced, a large iced green tea with extra, extra creamer. Like you're just drinking you know green half say, and half. The nightmare, <laughs> the nightmare ones I think of. It's like the uh. so I this was kind of a rural mm-hmm. tea house space, but not far enough outside of like Carborough Chapel Hill. People would bike there. You would get like the cyclist okay. who would yeah. come in at like yep. eight a.m. Saturday morning, and they all want cortado. Like half yeah, oh my god, they all the fucking cortado. and they're all paying with cash, and they're like pulling the cash out of their bike shorts, and it's like sweaty. And so I just remember being like. <laughs> It's early in the morning, so you'd often be like one person on shift. Yeah. And it's just a line of cyclists who come in and they all want cortados paid for in cash. And, so yeah. Cool. What's with the cyclists wanting cortados? That's something I've seen here at our local I don't know. coffee shop. It feels shop. so Seattle. Like, yeah. This is, this is like Alamance C- County. Like, this is like Portlandia <laughs> IRL. Have like come to Alamance <laughs> County. Yeah. It's so weird. We um, should take a bike tour at AFS. Can you rank my uh, my coffee order? Oh my Tell god. Me. Okay, it's a Quattro Americano uh with uh honey. I'm fine with that. I love okay, making cool. Amer- Americano is one of the easiest things to make. Yeah. Dom is being cool. facetious. That's my order, and Dom is terrified. <laughs> no, I after I made it for you the one time, I was just like, espresso tea. I dig it. Yeah. yeah. Espresso yeah. tea. I loved I loved getting Americanos because I'm like, I don't have to froth yeah. anything. Yeah. I can do the shot, pour yeah, it in. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. One of the best things you can order for a barista. See, look, I know how to make the barista's life easy. And, and I always been a okay. knows how to order to make the barista's life easy. That's right. Yeah, also, this is why I order four shots too. Well, like one because I'm a nut for caffeine or whatever, but also go. because <laughs> also because I know that most baristas are pouring double shots and if you get a large, it's three. And why why make it three when I could just exactly. give have four exactly. so they can no, just put it all in there. It's just it's like easier. And if you're nice them. enough to your barista, they won't charge you for the fourth shot because yeah, they're gonna they're have like, to make it anyway. Gotta make it anyway. That's how I ended up drinking so much coffee. <laughs> The oh my gosh! Shots. I do miss anyway. the free coffee of when I was oh a barista. God, yes. the, the place where I worked, it it no longer exists, which is quite mm-hmm. sad. Um, or it's an it's an event space now. But Dom, very fun. Dom, I think you should ask us one. I think it'd be funny. Okay. Um, <laughs> what is a secret talent that Victoria Landers has that no one would know about besides you? Oh, there are many. <laughs> 
I don't I don't know. I mean, I don't know I, I don't know which one you're thinking of specifically. Oh, we're not thinking of one specifically. We just wanna know. <laughs> so I'll say I'll say one that will make them look really good. Vic two things. Victoria, if you need a wedding planner, Victoria is like oddly really good at planning Ooh, weddings. Like super yeah. hidden talent. Like you need to go work for this. Vic, Victoria let's ha- do it. <laughs> Vic I should say Vic Vic yeah. Landers is um one of my closest friends and our podcast producer on Good Folk. They are amazing. We met while teaching. Um, <laughs> we work together in rural schools. But yeah, they are a hidden florist and painter. And what? No, not, not so much a hidden. So painter, many. Vic is Vic is a florist. photographer primarily. Wow. Um, but yeah, we'll movie. make we'll make incredible florists, <laughs> floral bouquets. Wow. Best gift giver. Um, but also has planned a lot of impromptu weddings for friends and does a kick that's awesome. job. So hell yeah! I've told Vic they can plan my elopement if it Vic, happens. Vic, let's go. That's awesome. <laughs> Can yeah, you hire them? Oh, yeah. plan an elop- I guess so. Okay. Yeah. You'd gotta have like the elopement and then like a party. You, you need know? to have like, one person. Yeah. Like, you gotta have like yeah. Yeah. You, gotta you gotta have, have like party. one person yeah. who knows. I think. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? We have time so, for this, or yeah, should we move them. move to? Okay, but well, let's let's move to the. Let's, okay. Okay. I- we have one more. I'll ask you later. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm wordy. <laughs> it's like, no, wait, it's okay. wait, wait. We can ask this last one as long as it's just you answer with a number. Answer with this with a number. All right, all right. Okay, how many times have you done NaNoWriMo? God, successfully, like, four? It's that's a, probably that's a lot. That's so good. That's really good. That's yeah. really good. I should, wow. say, I should say I've also done two where I've led it with my students, and they've done it successfully, but I was oh, really yeah. yeah. Nice. I have a couple of students who I who I coached into doing it. So, yeah, big hell fan yeah. of NaNoWriMo. Love them, and, yeah. and they're awesome as an organization. I work with them in my day job, and they're great. Hell Yeah. Death Loris has done it twice, apparently. Um, yes, chat, amazing. So hell yeah. Let's do it. All yeah, right. Join the support group. <laughs> Dom, why don't you uh, address this chat question? Question mark here while I queue up a game for us. <laughs> wait, what chat question? I feel afraid of the this game. This <laughs> on the dog. I didn't. Wait, I don't. I don't know how to ask that. I didn't write that. Uh, maybe Death Loris is attempting to. Say something about oh. <laughs> you didn't know that. No, that was I think should have gone in brainstorm oh. space. Oh, maybe that was like here or something. Okay. I we just have okay in our here. in our document with our questions. We just have something that says "Old Gods of Appalachia," and I'm like, is that a question? It's like that's, underneath. That's about, it's underneath read, chat your, read your book for your your pine. God. Yeah, read the book for the pine yeah. god. Yeah, exactly. Old Gods of Appalachia is it's a podcast, as far as I know. Um, but maybe, I don't. Maybe I, I. It is a podcast. I am the worst podcast creator ever, in that I don't really listen to other podcasts. Every um, podcaster <laughs> I know is like that. Yeah, you have to be I a know. real kind of it's freak. Like, and or I just live in. I guess live in Brooklyn is the only yeah. way you listen to other people's podcasts. I'm just like I don't have time. Like I, I, I only have enough time to manage our podcast. I love everybody else who runs a podcast. I don't have time to listen to them. That is very fair. Exactly. Yeah. Um. Okay, so I'm gonna. I hear queue it's up. good. Old Gods of Appalachia. I hear it's really fun. Multiple people have Hell recommended yeah. it to me. So, yeah, who who knows exactly? But I am going to queue up something for the public. So this is normally on our show. If you've seen it before, yeah. um, we do a tier list. Dom, would you care to explain a little bit about this thing that we're doing this time, or what what's different about what we usually do and? That kind of yes, thing. I can. Spencer, how does it feel that you will forever be associated with a bold new direction? That feels fun. I'm I'm cool with that. Well, if you uh, hit watch stream, you will see where we are going with this. And basically, sometimes we have you do uh, we have the guests do a podcast uh, as a way to rank everyday life. But we realize uh, there might be a better one of or for, or for you. I'm sorry, tier list. We have them uh, tier list might be a better one for you because you are so aesthetically minded and uh, and yes. like goaded with <laughs> goaded with uh, uh, the the layout and so, so i think we want you to be the first folklorist on the show instead of making a tier list to make a starter pack okay so here was our our test example starter pack <laughs> a folklorist starter pack um and uh for should, should this... we say if someone do, if someone doesn't know what a starter pack is a starter pack is oh, yeah. a, is 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 a meme where you uh, visually list uh, what you would think of. It's like okay, when I taught intro of? folklore, yeah. we would put on the board what is folklore, and this is what would get listed on the board. Exactly. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Uh, 
Um, Shouts out to Jack Wagner who invented the starter pack <laughs> meme. I think he has a folk he has a folklore podcast. Yeah. Now. Anyway. So we set it up like this, where we are hoping that you would help us craft here today an environmental futurism starter pack. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, I love it. So we have some like examples on text of the things that we're kind of looking for. You're also welcome to adjust the font and the background if you want. Um, anything like that, but anywhere you're you see this yeah, and you think, color. yeah, the background color. If you're thinking like environmental futurism, what are the first things that come to your mind that fit into these categories? We can go in any order, whatever one jumps out to you. <laughs> okay, well we got to do a background color as okay. like a forest green. All color, right, which is my favorite green. color, but also it's it's got to happen okay so i'm doing some you're so right honestly okay so i'm doing like a green how about like uh what do we think like a forest is that yeah like a forest think? like is that yeah oh, that's that looks good there, that's pretty yeah, good yeah, yeah. okay yes all right does the font gotta be white now or do we keep it black we keep it black or white what do you think i'm okay with the black I'll leave it for now okay Cool. This stuff can get covered too. They'll be covered by images or okay. whatever. So yeah. I am using Adobe Express to like search through their images on the side or like you know, the media elements or whatever. So we're gonna just go with that. And if it's not there, I'll try to copy paste it from the internet. We try. We worked. We workshop this. It will work. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So two things. I don't okay. know if they'll come up, but I'm Hell thinking yeah. I've got album art and book covers. So okay. album art. I gotta go. Adia Victoria, a Southern Goth which I recommended okay. earlier, but which is like the best album ever. Um, there are so many, Probably there's a great we'll song in there. Probably we'll have to go on that. Google. Okay. Great album, Idea Victoria is amazing. Um, there's a song on there called South Gotta Change, which I think really speaks to like the history of the South and the future of the South. Um, there's a great song on there called Carolina Bound that I listen to every time I drive home. It's a very excellent album. And then book cover, the one that comes to mind if you're Googling is um, Boys of Alabama by Genevieve Hudson, which is like an incredible queer Southern Gothic novel where um, one of the characters uh -huh. is a pansexual witch and the other character can bring things back from the dead. And it deals with like football as a cult and religion in Alabama. And it's like so good in terms of modern neo Southern Gothic, um, but also just what is it to be a southerner in this moment you know one of the boys is a german immigrant family um, comes over to work in car at a car plant and like <laughs> that is the south today so yeah hell yeah, yeah remind excellent. me the the title of the boys book of again. alabama okay. by boys genevieve of hudson alabama. yeah genevieve hudson who i think lives in the pacific northwest now but is from alabama and um yeah that book got is it. oh my god yeah, this is that so book good. and yeah. then ashley bryant phillips sleepovers if we're just if you want book recommendations. Asher Brian Phillips is a Eastern North Carolina writer who is now teaching at App State, who is also amazing. And Sleepovers is um, a one through the Hub City Press, which is a South Carolina independent press, the C. Michael Curtis book prize, um, selected by Lauren Groff, who's another Florida writer. So hell yeah. I know we don't have room for both, but those Oops. are my recommendations. I could talk Hell about yeah. this all day. <laughs> all right. Um, well, that's awesome. We always love recommendations too. They'll get put in the chat by our mods or friends of the show who are listening and want to drop links. But this is what we got here. So what next is speaking to you? What else we got to have? Landscape and environment. I got to go with the ghost, the ghost forest. Um, specifically, if you want to search Hunting Island, South Carolina, that is the Ooh. one that I work in. It is where I have set. I changed my whole novel to be set there. Um, that's a good idea. Because it is okay. just, hunting yeah. island. Or you could try, it? yeah, hunting island, like, like, hunting with a. G. Sounds like birds. Yeah, it's also a really great one for environmental change because it's a it's a <gasps> barrier Got island. It. So I spent some time working. Yeah. I, I talked to a park ranger there this summer, and they were saying like the challenge is that you know this is a it's a state park, and so we're pouring all this money into, but if we were actually doing what the landscape wanted, we would let it die because a barrier island is designed to basically protect the mm -hmm. coast and then disappear. So yep. there's this whole part of the island that's like broke off. And then yeah. now they where the ghost forest is, it's like a whole separate tip that, you know, they've built a bridge and it's like, we're trying to preserve this island that doesn't actually really want to be. Preserved. So that yeah. to me speaks a ton to environmentalism. Hell yeah. What about a snack and a, or a drink? Um, either or it could be it could be a container also I think would be fine like if you wanted to do like a water bottle or something I feel like okay there's two drinks that I feel like you would see the classic environmental folklorist it'd be like okay. a hydro flask oh my god or yeah. like a keep cup with like black coffee in it or like an Ooh, oat latte in a keep cup, or like a matcha latte in a keep cup Jordan I feel like always has her matcha latte in her no. keep cup yeah i'm thinking about that so these have some good image i'm gonna go i'm gonna go to google again because i think that i'll just find one that's like fun, like more transparent but um hydro flask and then i'll also do a keep cup 
Uh, Daisy, remind. You got a color. Well, <laughs> no, like... I was going to say, we got to do this with like a USU folklorist uh, just because I need to see the Stanley Tumblr on one. Oh my God, I know. I know. I thought about it because I just caved and got oh one God. on sale. Yes. And I like, no. I, yeah, I just, <laughs> I just saw my hydro flask. Yeah. The problem is every time I go to drink on my hydro flask, I end up like spilling it all over myself because it's so wide mouth. You could oh, also go with the Nalgene too. here. Like a Nalgene yeah. that's like clipped to a back. Yeah. That's another. Yeah. And check this out. I have. Pr oh, that made that Make look it. really bad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like it. It's it's white background. On it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like, I could. Uh, we'll just. At least, this one will be okay. Um, Yeah. I have premium so we can do like, uh, you know, cool, actual cool shit. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'll, I'll grab another picture. Um, What else do you think for like celebrity? Yeah, I'm trying to think because there's like, so the first person who comes in, to mind for me in terms of just a folklorist is always Zora Neale Hurston. Oh, the yeah. The original Southerner. Oh, We totally. both went to Barnard. We've both spent time right. at UNC. I just like, cannot, I cannot detach the practice of folklore from Zora Neale Hurston, which is less about environmental See. futurism, but I think speaks so incredibly well to the future of no, folklore. No, but she, she does so, though, and she inspired, like, okay, I love a huge Octavia and, Butler and fan. Like, I was going to say yeah, Octavia like, Butler is the other one. Yeah, speaking of, both. okay, okay, because, like, I'm a huge Octavia Butler fan, and she's, like, one of my two favorite um, sci-fi authors and kind of, like, the founder of Afrofuturism a little bit, but, uh... Yeah. I'm, yeah. Uh, but, yes, I mean, like, they kind of have to be together. <laughs> and challenging the I idea wonder. as well of, like, the okay, end of yeah. the world. Um, I was... I tested if Zora Neale Hurston was on Adobe Express. People can't see it at home, but I did that because I'm so I was curious if like her image was licensed, and I was gonna be like, "Ooh, yikes about it." But um, anyway, okay. I, I, I also like to think that like the 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 there's like a scene in their eyes were watching God where they like the Seminoles are like, "Hey, don't stay here during a hurricane," and they're just like, "If if you knew what you were doing, you would still own this country." Oh my god! And so then true. all of them die in a hurricane or get rabies. The end. Amazing. Like, yeah, I think that is I, that's a very appropriate pick. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry for spoiling a very good book, everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Join the Patreon. Yeah, we've got a video Butler's about known it. Known enough that yeah, yeah. I think that's that's okay. Yeah. Um, and we can I can like scoot stuff around too. Doll doesn't need to be. Yeah. Um. Okay. So ones that we uh don't have yet are like a quote or maybe. Oh, a fit check. So the fit, fit check, check is we sort of like pieces check. of clothing. It could be a whole outfit. It could be just a, one piece of clothing, whatever. So the fit check, I feel like it's just like, in my world, just like a classic leather jacket and like a white. Like I cannot think of anything that right. I would wear other than that. And I feel like that's really classic. But that might also just be me thinking of myself as an folklore. Well, we could put leather jacket. I could see uh, what we got here, something like this. Like a bomber jacket like or this what? this kind or like, like a different it, like, kind? I feel like any of them. I have a version of every kind of leather jacket out there. But Ooh, that's that's my specific thing. That's... Tell me I can't remove backgrounds? Okay, yeah, I can. I was like, what? Okay. There's no way I can't do that. Okay. <laughs> okay, and then you said, did you say something else too? Or did you just say the leather jacket and... I just put like a white tank top. I feel like it's just a super okay. classic Southern or not even Southern. I don't know. Like any sort of white dress feels very Southern. Okay. Oh, about yeah. like, uh, you mean like a tank top tank top or like, uh, well, like, okay. So my version is I would just wear like old jeans and like white tank top, but I also think like the, the classic image of like the white dress or, Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. What if we do like a, yeah, white dress or something, but I hope it doesn't give wedding. Yeah, you know okay. the vision of like the southern gothic -y kind of like something like dress. that. Yeah, I feel mm. like it's got to be like long sleeved. Um, almost. I'll type in very oh, like Ethel Kane. Ah, here thinking. we go. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Um, I'm thinking. <laughs> so I'm thinking of something like this, but not that. Uh, that's not really it. Ah, uh, what about that? <laughs> yeah, that's better. That's a good. That's a good image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Hell very, yeah. very like that. Ethel yeah. Kane, life in the middle of nowhere, yeah. romanticizing the church. Yeah. Totally, totally. Um, yeah, we can like scoot these around all we want and uh, make everything visible here. That's a really good one. I think, um, yeah, any like shoes or anything? Are we good? Blendstones. It's got to be Blendstones. What is, I don't even know what that is. Blendstones, blend, you're saying? Blendstone? B L U. N D 
S-T-O-N-E-S. This is like the classic shoe that I feel like I'm. Oh, I know what I know. Yeah, I was like, you would know. I know the shoe. I just didn't. I just didn't know what they were called. I know exactly. Because they're like waterproof. Oh my god! Literally wear them like while you're in the mud. I I know exactly the shoe. Yeah. I'll put these up here. Oh, like these. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, those bad boys. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, We have quote here, and we know that that one might be a little bit more challenging. This could be something we could look up. It could be something from your own mind. Um whatever works yeah. but so okay so this is a very long quote but i i changed the entirety of my thesis when i read this archie green quote on sitting with tension that i mentioned earlier oh which yes I think, mm-hmm. oh that's so I, like good. i just pulled it i literally just went back to my lit <gasps> review notes oh, to pull so it up and i can i just read the whole quote and feel free to like care f- like you can literally just put like yeah it with tension in the quotes um or the p or the person the piece that i would put on here is each piece of human tension that folklore is ought to be um, cause Peace that has like changed my whole worldview of, of how do we sit tension? with tension in environmental work, but I'll read you the whole quote. Yeah. Do it once you, yeah. So, okay. So this is from, um, a 1993 piece by Archie Green, which was quoted by Deborah Kodish, but it said, we must touch issues of cultural pluralism at every place they erupt, every place in the polity where there's a wound, every place where people rub each other on matters of identity or race, gender or occupation. Folklorists need to consider a de-skilled workforce, a closed textile mill, a fire in a chicken plant, a conflict between Hasidic Jews and black folks, a conflict on an Indian reservation over nuclear. Each piece of human tension, that's what folklore ought to be. That's our goal. Public folklore has to move into these areas, and it will only move if young academic folklorists are challenged by these problems. By dealing with issues of cultural pluralism, national identity, rurality, occupational skill, and ethnicity, we may move ahead. If folklorists are not advocates for these issues, then they have little to do. Day-to-day tasks reduce to rubble. Hell yes. And that has been a very defining concept for my own approach to this work of how do you work in a space of crisis without trying to save How do you, or how do you sit with the tension that the, the places you work in are very likely to be lost and to reframe our idea of like loss as a really bad thing. Um, but to think of loss as just a potential different way of seeing the world. Hell yeah. Um, I'm going to just, I'll fill this with the same like green and we'll just see what happens here. But something, yeah, I want to make sure that that's, cl- I want to make sure that that's close enough <laughs> to the quote that it doesn't look like I'm miss, I'm completely like misrepresenting it, but is it's it something- our goal. Is it? Yeah. We much trust issues of cultural pluralism. Um, each at every key- place they erupt. Okay, yeah, at at every place they erupt, dot, 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 each piece. I think you're missing an L in pluralism. Thank you. And and, and it says... I think of it, each piece of human tension, that's our goal. Let's see. That's not quite right. Each piece of human tension, that's where a folklorist ought to be. And then Ah, it says that's our goal. Okay, that's where folklorists uh, ought to be. Yeah. I, I summarize it often by just saying sitting with the tension concept yeah. for cultural studies. Yeah, totally. Okay, hell yeah. Do you want me to put like any... Um... Actually, I'll bring this quote forward because it can be in front of people to some degree. Something like this. I'll put it in front of, in front of everything um, because it is everything. And... What do you think? Is this is this sufficient? Is this is you able to see things on this? Here, let me move the little uh, Stanley Cup. We can just kind of do a little something like this. Maybe a little something like this. Make it look a little more uh, clear somehow, some way. Maybe I'll fill it with a different shape. It Any, looks good to me. Anything else you <laughs> I feel would like? like... <laughs> this is like my can my cannon starter pack. So good, good, <laughs> and yay! They, they did a good job. Yeah. These yeah. are the people I will make you read. This is <laughs> the stuff you will have to listen to, and this I will talk great. to you about Archie Green. So. Oh my God! Yeah, Ar- yeah, very good, Archie Green. Yeah. Um, something like this, and then maybe I'll try to make uh, this slightly smaller, just so that we can see. Hell yeah! Okay, that looks pretty good. I'm happy. Like that. This is fun. Thank y'all. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. So do you want, you want to change the font or anything? Everything looks good. 
it's good with me. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, I, I would say go- <laughs> if we're going really classic me, it's like Times New Roman, but I'm unexciting. So that's very that's fair. That's harder to read. <laughs> well, uh, according to this interview, you're not um, unexciting. I think you're very exciting because I learned a ton from you, and this is amazing. And wow, thank you for being our like first person to do a starter pack with us. I'm gonna switch back over to. Us I'm on happy screen. to blaze new territory. As Hell Tom yeah. <laughs> That was super fun. Um, Yeah, and it it worked pretty well. And I think this looks really cool. So I'll go ahead and save this and send it off to you. But um, I guess the final thing here is to say it once again. Thank you, Spencer, for spending time with us, going a little over time to just like tell us all about how important the Southern Gothic is, rurality is, thinking about ecology through creative writing and thinking about all these different subjects that we covered in the interview today and folks seem to already be doing it in the chat if you have them drop ladders which is like our kind of hype applause from the audience if you don't have them drop a hearty ggs uh and spencer thank you for hanging out with us and spending time with us today this is awesome thank you for having me yeah and feel free like to share my email for anyone who wants to chat yeah drop any of the stuff more yeah yeah i don't know how to drop it in chat but no, Dom's we've, we've got you, people. Yeah, don't worry. Dom's doing Thank it for you. you. Dom's dropping good folks only. We're dropping sub yeah, stack. My social all is all the same. Like, li- I, yeah. as I said with podcasting, I slide into people's DMs all the time. So feel free to slide into mine. I love yeah. that. Um, and I could talk about these things for yeah. hours. Anybody, if you go to so, our... Yeah. If you go to Folkwise social media, Spencer's tagged in our schedule post for this. And will be when the interview comes out probably in about two weeks from now. Yeah, yes, cool. and I'll say we we look forward to having Daisy dropping yeah. on Good Folk soon. So awesome. stay tuned, Folkwise <laughs> community. Yeah, Hell it yeah. should come out about the same time. So yeah, it's really gonna be cool. To, gonna be cool to have that conversation. Hell yeah! Uh, well, this is your natural out. You can leave if you want. I think I'm gonna try to defeat. I think I'm gonna try to jump back into Red Dead I think and do uh, it. try to beat this battle. So you're welcome to stay. I think if you you've got to but... do it. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna let you tell me Hell how yeah. it goes because I, will. I have to I'll go. Tell you. I have to go read my homework. Go to sleep. Um, go to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because your homework. But <laughs> yeah. thank you all for chatting. It was super fun to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank absolutely. you so much for coming on. Yeah. Quilts have had to be on many levels. Making quilts helps me help me to get a sense of my own way.